you all to the international lecture series on biological and electrical microgrids, land, maritime, and space applications, which is organized by ITB Power and Energy Society, SBC and ITC, in association with Industrial Power Group and ITB PES Young Professionals Kerala. Next, I would like to welcome the eminent speaker for the evening, Professor Joseph M. Greer. He has been a professor with AAU Energy, Arbog University, Denmark, where he is responsible for microgrid research program. From 2019, he became a Willem investigator by the Willem Founder, which supports the Center for Research on Microgrids at Arbog University, being Professor Guerrero, the founder and director of the same center. His research interest is oriented to different microgrid frameworks in applications like microgrid clusters, IoT-based and digital twin, maritime microgrids for electrical ships, ferries, and seaports, and space microgrids applied to nanosatellites and closed ecological systems. Professor Pedro is an associate editor for a number of IW transactions. He has published more than 800 general papers in the field of microgrids and renewable energy systems which are cited more than 70,000 times. During eight consecutive years from 2014 to 2021, he was awarded by, he was awarded, he was awarded by Private Analytics as highly cited researcher with 50 highly cited papers in 2021. He received the ITB Biomill Boast Award for industrial electronic applications in energy systems for his pioneering contributions to renewable energy-based microgrids. Next, I would like to welcome all the participants who are attending the session. I would also like to ask the participants to put up their queries in the chat box, which can be taken towards the end of the session. Over to you, sir. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, talk here about biological and electric microgrids uh, in different applications, land, maritime, and space applications. Um, probably more focused on, on this last part, uh, space applications, because it's where we have more um, research recently and it's going to be also very soon a phd defense in a couple of weeks about also uh, solar uh, panels uh, degradation in and modeling for space applications so if you have the interest i can also share with you the the link very soon to to be connected to one of these uh, presentations uh, I want to dedicate uh, this presentation to my my wife and our baby who's coming uh, this August. And uh, here, um, as you as you may know, and if you have more interest, you can you can also check in our website of our center. Uh, we basically uh, work on different uh, microgrid aspects, and. Um, and recently also, you can see that how uh, all these ideas that are uh, having used uh, for a lot of years are applied to different uh, concepts. So we come more from electrical energy uh, microgrids. But here I will show you also how we can expand these ideas also to biology, which is one of, I will say, most exciting um, areas of research nowadays. <clears throat> this is also my team. Um, we have uh, around 50 people working on different aspects uh, and areas of microgrids uh, in our center. Uh, right now, uh, there is uh, more than 20 uh, PhD projects ongoing. 
and also a number of industrial uh, projects. We work also with companies. Uh, I will show you, show you here some examples. And our research frameworks are uh, multi-micro-grid uh, clusters. We also work on digital twins and uh, IoT and security, cybersecurity. Probably, if you have the interest, I, I could prepare another talk more focusing on, on, on this area, especially we have been working a lot on cybersecurity the recent years. And, and also, we have right now um, making some research also on blockchain. And I think that that could be also of, of your interest. And then uh, we have been work in the maritime area also, starting right now, uh, probably like seven, eight years ago, uh, with big projects with one of our biggest companies here in Denmark, Maersk Drilling, to look more on electrification of ships. And, and I think that we develop a lot of very exciting uh, concepts for ship electrification. Uh, and I believe it will be um, this year, three PhD students to be graduated. So if you have the interest, I could invite you also for that. It's going to be one working with DC, uh, medium voltage DC uh, systems in ships. The other is more for power management systems in ships. Uh, and still uh, we will have another one, uh, which also will be very soon, more working on, on, the, on the integration of energy storage in uh, ships and boats for the integration also with uh, seaports. We, have, we are right now working a lot with seaports, also electrification. So this is another exciting area. And what we, I will present you here also, it's our last research on space uh, microgrids. A little bit uh, thinking about uh, all, one of the issues that we know that today is uh, super important in our field is about artificial intelligence. And we know that right now, because a lot of disciplines, uh, it's uh, something that, that is already being uh, used a lot. Um, they are indeed um, inspired on the ways that, that we, uh, how human beings and animals uh, think and behave. And um, our source of inspiration, one of the source of inspiration is basically our uh, brain. But when we look on the, what we call body brain uh, unit, it's not something that is separate as we thought uh, some years ago that we had like a central controller and then there is some units that are just slaves. It doesn't work like this. I think it's more uh, connected to what uh, you have in India, like the chakra systems. So you have here the seven chakras, one, two, three, and then here the number four, which is in the heart. So basically when you look on these uh, parts of the chakras, especially uh, lunar plexa, all these parts makes a lot of sense, especially that today we know that in our digestion system, we have around 500 million neurons. And then connected with the vagus nerve, we have also connection to our brain. And then if we look on the chakra number four, we have the basically the heart. So today we know that we have like 40,000 neurons here that are also activated many times when you have feelings of love, appreciation, and even for instance, hate. And then finally here we have the connection with the mind which we call the brain. Here we have much more, probably 80, 80 billion neurons here. Uh, so it's, it's 
probably what we call also like a totally distributed system, right? So also if if we think about the brain, it looks today something more similar as a multi-agent system rather than a central controller. So each of these uh, neurons are indeed units that are autonomous and individuals. And I think that this is a big uh, change of, of the concept. Um, and then if you uh, look on the different parts also, um, before we pass here, you can see here this part of the cerebellum, which has been developed with uh, reptilians, um, basically controlling all the part of the body which is needed for survive. And then uh, we have this other part, which is the, um, let's say, all this part connected with basal ganglias, and uh, etc. All this is what is called also the limbic system, which has been much more developed by mammals. And uh, it's more connected, let's say, with uh, feelings. So you can also see here, for instance, the hippocampus, which is more the part in which we store the memory. And now we understand that when we have certain feelings, then it needs to Feelings are sometimes needed to highlight some memories. Yeah, and this is, of course, something that has been due to the evolution. Uh, we, we are adding more and more layers in this brain. Uh, and finally, we have another exciting part, which is the uh, cortex. And this has been developed also a lot, especially with Let's say if you if you look on on monkeys and apes, they have been developed more this part, and still it's bigger and bigger here, especially the the prefrontal part in human beings. And this is uh, another exciting uh, part in which we can think about what will happen, for instance, in the future. Make plans. Making plans is something that that if you look on on animals, it's it's difficult for them to make plans. And, and in our case, we are planning all the time. And, uh, and that's uh, one of the things also that allow us to help also imagination. Um, very early, last century, uh, especially over the 70s, they start to look on 60s probably, they start to look on, on the waveforms of the brain uh, because they wanted to uh, measure if it will be the possibility of, of having telepathy, so, so connection between two people that are far away. Of course, they found that, they found that, that those uh, waveforms in the brain, they cannot go uh, very far away from the scalp. So it, it, it didn't work for that. But uh, they start to look seriously on, on those waveforms for medical purposes, so they could start to understand uh, the different phases in which uh, we can uh, work. And uh, this is some uh, very simple test that I did with this kind of band. It's, it's a very simple, so it's not something that you can use for, let's say, professional EEG tests, but it's enough uh, to get probably different bandwidths. And, and here you can see, the different bandwidth that uh, we have according to these waves. So this is for a normal adult brain waves. Uh, we have from 14 to 30 hertz beta waves, which is probably the highest uh, frequency we have. And then we have alpha, alpha waves from 8 to 13, theta waves from 4 to 7 hertz, and then below 3.5 five hertz, what we have is another bandwidth, which is called the de delta. So we have alpha, beta, delta, theta waves, and it depends on which is our stage. So for instance, when, when we are awake with mental activity, we, we are producing beta waves. But if we are in deep sleep situation, 
then we generate what is called delta waves, and then normal sleeping, the theta ones, and then we have awake and resting, what is called also alpha uh, waves. So here you can see this very interesting to see because uh, normally we have several stages uh, of sleeping during night, and, and probably we start uh, here in stage uh, one, and then probably go down more in deep. And then finally, uh, we can, we can uh, raise what is called also REM or REM sleep. Yeah. This is also the name of a pop band, right? So this means uh, remote eyes moving. So this means that on this situation, our eyes starts to move very fast, even if we are sleeping. And there's a high activity, very similar as we have in the awake situation. And this happened uh, four or five times every night. So or five, four or five times every night we go, we enter to deep sleep and we produce this kind of waveforms. And we can measure uh, those kind of things today. How much our brain we use uh, also in the past years, we thought that probably we just use five or 10% of our brains. But today we know that this is not true. We are using 100% of the brain. So take care because it's very dangerous to talk about using the brain. Uh, it's not true that we are over using the brain. We have, of course, a lot of potential in the brain, but the brain never stops. Um, simultaneously, however, we can just use a 2% uh, of, of the brain. So this means the equivalent of four watts of electricity. And, and four watts, it will be something like four watts of, of uh, some lightning that is uh, blinking in different parts of the brain. However, as we know, normally we use similar neural network paths, and that's why sometimes it's difficult for people to, to make changes in behavior. Even you want to change, still there is some event that triggers some kind of behaviors. Uh, and this is because on that behavior, a lot of synapses has been taken, uh, also considering different neurons. However, today we know that it's also possible to change thanks to what is called also um, neuroplasticity. So we are able to change the whole life. So, so it's, it's something that is evolving the whole life and it never stops. Here you can see also how is uh, our brain itself with what we call the reptilian brain, which is kind of active action-reaction brain, yeah, very uh, simple, which our past dinosaurs have and so on. So it's the first layer that has been developed in this very old uh, model. Yeah, It's a little bit more, if you think about electric power systems, it's very similar as the primary control. So this primary control it's just having an inertia and try to balance the system. Then if we think about the secondary control here, it's something similar as we have in the limbic brain in which we have emotions and feelings. Those emotions, of course, you have to think that are evolu evolutionary things. So uh, in the past, when, when something scary happened, then we will remember, okay, we don't have to go in this way because otherwise something scary will happen. And this kind of feeling, what he's doing is to highlight this memory in your hippocampus. Uh, probably one of the important parts is this green one, which is called also the amygdala, which is activated in case of having a danger, uh, danger, fears, negative in general uh, feelings, let's say. Um, and then we have the neocortex with all this rational part. So all this part is basically rational. And this, the frontal one, is the more evolution in, in our 
um, species, let's say. But it's very early, you can see, it's only 100,000 years. So many times what happened is that when we can see our brain as a decision maker, it takes the decision based on emotionals. And then it comes, the rational part, this neocortex, to come with the justification. These behaviors on the brain has been uh, also developed a lot of interesting um, controllers that right now we are mimicking in our, let's say, artificial intelligence-based uh, systems. So this has been devised by uh, this uh, Japanese professor in which he look on how the cerebellum is working. And what he said is that here, what in this first level of control, what we have is an input, and then we see the output, we have the targets, and we come with the error. So cerebellum is very something very automatic control, right? And then we have here in this part of, of the brain, the basal ganglia, we do something and then we can get a reward. This reward can come in the brain in terms of dopamine. When we do something that is very pleasant, oh, we get a stimulus, which is basically dopamine. And then what we are doing is to give a reward. So today we are able to reproduce this uh, in a control system by reinforcing when, when we feel that some of these outputs are interesting or, or good for our system. And then in this other level, what we have in the uh, cortex part, let's say what we have is unsur unsupervised learning. So directly giving the orders back to the secondary control and back to the primary control. So we can think that these three levels of control, it's a little bit also what we are reproducing when we talk about uh, electric systems as well. You can see here that important thing, I talked before about the dopamine. Um, when you are increasing in stress, there is an optimum point in which stress is good. But then, of course, it, if a stress goes up, it appears the effects of anxiety, panic, bad health, and the phenomena of burnout. So there is indeed one place in, the, in which it's optimum to, to work with stress. And, and that's because of the, of, the, of the balance, let's say, of motivation, especially with these uh, two neurotransmitters. But we will not talk about this. Right now, we can see that also when we uh, have the processing in the brain, if we imagine that here we have the, uh, the eyes and then we have this connection to B1, which is called also the early visual cortex. When we see something, then it happens that we have two uh, main paths. One is the dorsal pathway, which is talking about where. So we try to find where we are, where we are seeing this. And then we have another way, which is the ventral pathway, which is the what. So it starts to look on different patterns to understand what we are uh, seeing here. And uh, I will say that these ideas are also going in deep with a lot of uh, our engineering paths. You can see also that connected to this uh, amygdala and the mesencephalum and the dorsal strium uh, part, these are three areas that they are activated when we trust or when we have fear. So this means that we cannot feel these two things at the same time. And we have basically two empathy systems. First one is the logic empathy, which are basically mirror neur neurons which was also uh, an issue uh, in the 90s and was a subject for, a, for, for a, a very important award also. The uh, discovery of those ones and give us what is called also logic empathy. And then we have also emotional empathy. So when you look someone 
and feeling pain, and then you feel something similar, then, then it's basically the mirror neuro system what is uh, activated. And now today we know that there's a lot of also communication between what is the heart and the brain. And you can see that when we have feelings of frustration, irritation, etc., our uh, brain waveforms with the heart, they go in, co in uncoherence. And when you have positive uh, feelings, then you can see that the waveforms in the heart and in the brain, they go in coherence. And the way to measure this is to measure the heart rate. Uh, some of us think that the heart rate is something has to be fixed, like a number that the doctor gives to you, but is indeed changing all the time. And you can see here, when you have this kind of uncoherence uh, state, like frustration, anxiety, worry, irritation, you have a non-periodic waveform and a lot of harmonics. While if you are in coherence, positive emotions, appreciation, love, courage, you can see that it's almost a pure sinusoidal uh, waveform. In this kind of control system, what we are trying is to achieve constant blood pressure. And this is achieved by changing the heart rate. So that's a good place in which uh, we, we measure this. I will come back uh, at the end of the presentation with these uh, concepts, but I want to show you now which are our last advances, especially in space uh, microreads. Um, when we think about uh, putting uh, microreads in space, we have uh, nanosatellites. And in the case of a nanosatellite, uh, we have this um, kind of uh, nanosat, which is called also CubeSat. And a CubeSat, it's a, a satellite made of cubes. And by the way, it has been invented by, by someone also born in Catalonia, Spain, and uh, right now in the United States. And right now it's one of the main uh, inventions that are being used, especially for nanosatellites. And you can see that what they are uh, using are PV panels, and then battery systems. And then we have a number of loads like electric uh, transceivers, flight control computers, and many other payloads. Of course, antennas for telecommunications and so on. When you are in, in the Earth, you can see this is the typical air mass 1.5 spectra. So this is basically for each length of a wave that we have, how much is the energy that we can get? And this is for all the col different colors, including infrareds and ultraviolets. So, so here the idea is that we have something that is very, let's say, uh, not very smooth, and it's very low in comparison what, of what we have in the air mass zero, which is what we have in space. And this is because the atmosphere is basically filtering a lot of this energy. So we can get, I would say, around 20 to 30% more energy in, out in space than that in the Earth. And this is a lot. Yeah, so this is a good thing. Um, if we want to get the maximum efficiency of these solar cells, we are able to achieve very good efficiency for very narrow uh, spectra. However, if we want to have for a very wide spectra, high efficiency, what we need to do is to stack these different kinds of technologies together. So to get the best of them and to have high efficiency in higher bandwidth. You see, this is one response, another response, another, these are frequency response of each of these solar cells. And then when we stack together, we get very good and efficient uh, solar cells. All these solar cells has been developed for space application, but right now today we are starting to see those kind of applications also in the earth. So it's kind of the space is pushing us to change things uh, in the earth. Uh, this is one example with a triple junction uh, solar cell, but you can see right now in the market also four junctions. 
Um, and then here is the basic uh, scheme of a, of a microgrid in a national satellite. So you have basically solar panels in the different axes. If you have, for instance, a CubeSat, each of these cubes have different faces. And then you can have independent uh, power converters with independent MPPT for each of these phases. And then we have directly connection to battery pack. And why directly connection? Uh, that's because uh, if you want better efficiency, it's better to be connected directly to the batteries. And it's also good for the stability of the whole system. The charge of the batteries is just uh, controlled by those converters. So this doesn't need any extra uh, converter. This is also a trend that is happening in some uh, ships. You can see electric ships also going with this concept. Yeah. So also you're very welcome if you want to discuss uh, on, on ships, uh, how, how are these things also going. And then we have some loads that are directly connected to the battery system and some others uh, connected to some uh, converters. You can see here a little bit the high efficiency we can get from these solar cells. So we are a little bit much uh, beyond for um, uh, typical silicon uh, solar cell that you can get in, in on the earth. So here we have especially for junction, it's on this band uh, more than 30% of efficiency. And this is just uh, one of the solar cells that we are using with our uh, collaborator here in Denmark. You can see also that GOM Space, which is our uh, collab collaborator company here, uh, they use also lithium ion uh, batteries. And, and I think that this, is, this has been also a big change in the space, uh, also thanks to the electric vehicle uh, industry, because those kind, those kind of uh, battery systems has been decreased uh, more and more uh, the price and uh, resiliency has been increased a lot. Uh, so also you have deep charge and discharge cycles, which is something very attractive, especially in a nanosatellite, because we have very often uh, eclipses, especially this happen in geostationary satellites. So you can see that sometimes we are here and we get the maximum energy from the sun and then we arrive on this part. And in this part, we have to get the energy from the battery and back to the payloads. And this is happening for a long time in a geostationary application. So several hours. So that's why it's, it's so important. Um, one of the things we have to consider is also that, especially this doesn't happen with low Earth orbit satellites like these ones that are basically between 700 and 2,000 kilometers. But when we, you have, for instance, geostationary ones, which are placed on 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth, then in a typical, for instance, 15-year uh, mission, then you could have a nominal equivalent fluence of 10 power 15 electrons per centimeter square centimeter. So this is quite a lot. And, and we know that, um, that all this is affecting the efficiency of, of the solar cells. So we can see how, how those solar cells are being degraded. Uh, and somehow we have very good efficiency, but also we have to take care about about how is the degradation, especially with electrons and protons that are coming from the sun and from solar storms and, and cosmic radiation. Uh, it happened also, we know that on the astronauts, because we have to take care of them, shielding and so on, to avoid that they get cancer because of this cosmic radiation. So, and this is something that also we learn also from let's say circuits, electronic circuits that works uh, inside um, nuclear plants, uh, because when you are using, for instance, a, micro pro a microprocessor and you try to embed in your space system, 
if there are some protons or electrons, especially protons, going inside those digital uh, electronics, then especially CMOS uh, circuits are hang up. This is also called latch up effect and has been studied by NASA for many, many years, maybe 15 years. So today still, when we design electronics, control electronics for satellites, we are doing everything in analog. So all the primary control layers are based on analog electronics and then uh, supervisory controllers can be done in, in a microprocessor. And sometimes what we have is an additional one that could be used as a redundancy. Another example of, of microgrid is the one which is placed in the International Space Station. So you can see here that right now we have 33,000 solar cells producing 240 kilowatts. And then we have batteries. In the past, I think it was lithium ion, uh, sorry, it was uh, lead acid batteries. All of these, all technologies has been replaced by lithium ion. Um, so you can see that very high efficiency solar cells here and also lithium ion batteries going to the space. And then this is what is called also primary power system. So basically generating electricity and storing and then using it uh, back to what is called the secondary power system. Secondary power system is just um, loads and unidirectional converters to accommodate the voltages in different uh, levels, but this is in one direction, which is makes also this system much more efficient. The other important uh, thing that happened in the International Space Station is that it has been changed from AC, the distribution system, to DC. So right now we can see that uh, the full uh, system is operating on, on DC. Uh, it has been also changed in the last 10 to 15 uh, years as well. Uh, uh, following this, um, right now we are also making research on, on lunar base applications. You know that at this moment there is only robotic missions, but uh, NASA have the, the plan with the Artemis mission to land into the moon. Right now they say that maybe 2025, we'll see. And, and also, of course, uh, Japan with the JAXA, uh, they, they plan to do it in 2030 and probably China with the CNSA, the 2036. Uh, well, those are the plans. And uh, right now there's a lot of, let's say, international interest on, on going to the moon, but to start having a, four to six months of stay duration. So this is what is going to call phase number two, going to one year and phase three and four, probably to have missions with extended and unlimited duration stay, probably 15 to 20 years. Still, this is, let's say, ongoing, the, the plans. And what we did in this, uh, in this project is to first determine what is the best site selection. If you go to the non-polar regions, uh, you have sunlight and dark periods of around 15 days each. So it's basically very difficult to get energy because you will need very large uh, size of energy storage systems. Uh, so that what it's more uh, interesting here is to choose polar regions. So polar regions, what we have is around six months with uninterrupted uh, sunlight. And then we have six months more with frequent illumination and darkness periods. So, so the point here is that we have low declination. So this means that, that here, what we are going to install, it's first uh, some towers. I will show you these towers uh, in the next slide. But here, what you can see is in the, in the South Pole, there is one a crater, which is called the Shackleton Crater. It has been also studied for many years in NASA. So you can find a lot of uh, information from there. And these uh, red dots are the most illuminated areas 
thinking on, on where we're going to put these photovoltaic towers. And then when we look on the North Pole, we have the Peary crater. So we have the South and we have the North. And this uh, Peary crater, it looks also a very interesting uh, place to be because you can see also these very illuminated points. And um, and here are the towers. So basically here it's, it's a tower giving an inclination of around 1.5 degrees only. And we need several hundred meters on these grounds to get a good illumination. You can see here one month of illumination on the crown of this crater. Yeah, this is the equivalent of one month, let's say. And you can see that, that it's, it's really very much illuminated. Exciting to, to see this, no? how, how we can do that. The other, the other thing is like where we are going to store the electricity. Of course, lithium ion batteries are in, but you know that they are, they are very heavy. So one of the most interesting technologies at this moment are regenerative fuel cells. And this is very exciting because this means that a fuel cell can be used on two directions. One direction to generate hydrogen and another direction in which you could um, you could get from this hydrogen back electricity. So you have both directions. Yeah? And in that case, it's a PM, PM a fuel cell that is uh, working like, like that in, in these two directions. Of course, it's not the most efficient uh, way, but it's, it's really uh, helping a lot, especially in terms of uh, space, because we can uh, store all this hydrogen in tanks and then probably distribute in different areas in the moon. So this is something also we, it is under discussion uh, if it's going to be uh, hydrogen pipes in the moon, like, you know, there's, there's some book also talking about, about hydrogen pipes in Mars. So, so probably it's, it's something uh, exciting here to, to have this solution. So here you can see, we talk about uh, energy storage generation, and now I, I want to talk about the loads. The main loads that we have here are the crew habitats with all the, all the appliances and communications. We have a laboratory exploration also with electric vehicles and robots, communications as well, and all these electric vehicles needs charging stations. And then we have something very interesting and appealing, which is the in situ resource utilization, which means that we will need a lot of materials and we need to, to find out, okay, what kind of materials we have already in the moon to don't be so dependent on the earth. So this is very exciting thing because probably new things are going to be able to be developed also in the moon. So it's also exciting from the viewpoint that everything looks very renewable uh, in terms of, of that in the moon, having solar panels, lithium ion batteries, electric vehicles, you know, here the, you can see also the habitat part, laboratory, and the in-situ resource utilization, and of course the communication system. I'm going to talk a little bit about communications here. Uh, there is also the charge, different charging station uh, for the electric vehicles and robots that there are. And then about communications, of course, we expect to have our own communications in the moon because latencies of several seconds between Earth and the Moon maybe make this unreliable. So we will need also our own satellites uh, and of course our own internet. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of deployment also on communications in the Moon and between the Earth and the Moon. And talking about how uh, we will integrate these energy storage systems, including batteries and and reverse uh, fuel cells. Single microgrid systems looks fine, but not enough for the high level of resiliency that we need, especially in space that we need a number of failures possible and still the system should be resilient with that. So multi microgrid systems looks to be, seems to be the best because you can deploy 
one part of your system and then easily you can expand. And then uh, if you have some failures, you could isolate some of these uh, microgrids and still make the other uh, to be operated. So this is how it looks like uh, our project together with the Shackleton crater uh, having different zones, microgrids, so number of microgrids for the different lunar habitats, uh, charging station laboratories and so on, uh, having those towers of photovoltaic systems and interconnecting the, the microgrids also with intercommunications and communications to the earth. And the hierarchical control, we go back again to the idea of the brain primary control, this, let's say, cerebellum part or reptilian brain, like the reactive control. And then we have in this other subsystem level control, the secondary control, which is more what we call the limbic system. And then in the mission manager, this tertiary control, again, we have this uh, cortex, neocortex part of, of this brain. Yes. So moving forward with uh, concepts in the space, uh, one of the things that we are working on is also how we can develop ecologic systems, small ecologic systems that can be used for the astronauts or for the future habitats in the moon to have oxygen, water and food and don't depend so much on the, on the Earth. This is a project that we are doing together with the European Space Agency and the Autonomous University of Barcelona, in which I'm also I'm a student on neuroscience with them. One way to do that is to create what is called also the terraforming. So you take one planet and you make like a became like the Earth. And this is too complicated, you know, it's very complicated to do something like that. So we believe that maybe we can start with having what we call so micro-ecologic -eco systems. So, and, and one of the few places that exist, uh, uh, one of these pilot plants is in Barcelona with this Melissa project. That's why we thought that it was a very good idea to start this collaboration with them, especially to give, as you see here, oxygen, water, and food for the astronauts. And you see here that we have a lot of contaminants from the astronauts, heat, CO2, respiration. And this is something that we do every day, urine, liquid, urine, solids, fecals, and so on. What we can do with that and how to close the system. If we want to close the loop we have here, that's why it's called it's MELISA, Microecologic Life Support System Alternative. It's that we have the astronauts generating their, their waste. And from this waste, we have thermophilic anaerobic bacteria, which they generate volatile fate acids, mineral and ammonia. And then in this other compartment, the photoeretrophic ones, what we do is we remove uh, these volatile fatty acids, generating CO2 and food production. And then from here, we have another compartment, which is the nitrification compartment, very important because um, from minerals and ammonia, we generate nitrates. And those nitrates are very important for the microalgae. And here is where the photosynthesis is being made. So we create photosynthesis. So we basically get photons from the sun or from other sources and create oxygen, removing CO2 from the astronauts. We have also another compartment storing the oxygen. And this is how the system works like a closed ecosystem, like we have in the earth, but small scale. Okay, so here we have the uh, pilot plan. Uh, and this uh, here we have the nitrification compartment. And here is the photobioreactor. And then here we have the higher plant compartment. Here inside, what we have is microalgae. So here is also making the photosynthesis. Yeah, so it's very important process here to generate oxygen for our crew members, which right now, as you can imagine, are rats. And uh, here, what we are trying to do is to fix the oxygen 
uh, around 20% of, uh, of the air. So that means that we have to keep the concentration of oxygen very tightly in 20%. If it's very high, we will poison the rats. If it's very low, they will die. So, so that's very important. However, here the challenge was the system is very complex, hundreds of state equations here, state variables. So it's not like two or three, like in some power electronic converters, it's hundreds because each of these compartments have more than 50 state uh, variables. And then they are very nonlinear, so it's very difficult to linearize and there's a lot of interaction. So maybe you stabilize one variable and another gets unstable. So this was complicated. Here, the idea was to look on a closed ecosystem, this biologic system, like a microwave, in which we could see that this compartment in which we create or develop the photosynthesis, what we are doing is to get from the sun photons and generate oxygen. Kind of the same that we what we do with photovoltaics from the sun, the photons we generate electricity, and then we store this oxygen in the case of our closed ecosystem in storage compartments. Similarly as we do with battery systems, for instance. And then we have something called microbial fuel cells, which works very similarly as fuel cells. Looking at those two systems, you can understand that they are similar from the way that our closed ecosystem don't depend on an ecosystem in the earth. The same as our microgrid is isolated from the main grid. So here it came the idea to use also a hierarchical control, which is the same control that we have inside our bodies as well, or minds, and is the same that in big power systems we have. So primary control can be used for power sharing in a microgrid. And here what we do is to control the mass flow regulation. Secondary control is for voltage and frequency restoration. And here we are doing the same. We are doing corrective actions for this primary control. And tertiary control, which is, again, this uh, neocortex brain part, it's especially for microgrids for energy management systems. And this is something that we do also every day. We make plans, we go into the future, come back to the present moment, take decisions. All these things that we are doing every day can be implemented in, in a microgrid by using artificial intelligence uh, tools. And here we do the same also with our power plant, uh, sorry, with our closed ecosystem plant by setting the appropriate uh, points of operation. And then we built another layer up and down, supervisory control, and what is called also uh, level zero uh, control. So also the people that comes from electric systems, they know that you need kind of current and voltage loops, PWMs. This is in level zero. In our case, it was more the control of the valves, you know, uh, open and closing. And you can see here, this is our uh, closed ecosystem and the primary control, secondary control, and tertiary control. I just noticed you that we were using a lot MPC, model-based predictive control for that. And uh, I think it's a very powerful tool for any kind of microgrid, just electric or biologic microgrids. Uh, it's it's amazing uh, tool. We have right now uh, published uh, also a book on MPC systems for, for microgrids. And if you have the interest, I think it's published right now in IET. So here, what is very interesting is to see that when we are changing the light system in the, um, in the compartment of photosynthesis, the photosynthetic compartment, you can see how we change the light intensity here and the oxygen generation is also changing accordingly. The same as in a photovoltaic system. And we store the energy, sorry, the oxygen in this oxygen tank. So you can see this percentage is, could be similar as the state of charge of a battery system. So now if you understand microgrids, you can understand that this biologic ecosystem can, we, can be uh, worked in the same way. 
So here you can see the different levels, different levels of control, very similarly controlled as a, in a microgrid, and the way that we have been uh, adjusting all these levels. So you can see also the level one, level two, and level three, basically changing uh, references. And, and you can see in level three that we are looking more on, on the span conditions. What will happen? Are we going to have enough oxygen at the end of the day? Because that's very important for survival. OK, I want to finalize uh, my presentation with, uh, with this last um, uh, image, which is a research that has been published in the last um, in the last few days, which is the new study uh, published on the frontiers on neural circuits, in which they saw how the brains of the cosmonauts are rewrite to adapt to the long-term space missions. I think that this is really amazing because it's kind of that all the structural connectivity has been changed after the long duration of the space flight. And this is the first study that uh, has been done. And we look forward to see more of these studies, especially when we are going to have long stays in, in the moon and possibly in the Mars. So thank you very much. I just want to finalize my uh, presentation with the sentence that I like very much from Albert Einstein. People that knows me knows that I like this sentence a lot. We cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that we create them. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for any questions or discussions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Participants, uh, if anyone have any questions, you can please unmute and ask. Participants, if you have any questions, uh, please unmute and ask. Uh, uh, write the questions in the chat box. Sir? Yes. Sir, there is one question in the chat box. Yeah, I'm trying to open the box. One uh, of the participants asked, uh, artificial neural networks based predictions need long-term microgrid data. Can you suggest some resources for long-term data of existing microgrids? Well, as, as, open access, uh, as open data, I don't know it directly, but we have uh, data for around five to six years of our uh, own uh, microgrids in the, at the university, so we could provide this data if you contact us. And we have been used also for, uh, for many publications and studies, so we, are, we will be happy to share with you. The second question, so please, uh, Swati, if you can uh, contact me later, you're very welcome. Um, the other question is about uh, what are the voltage levels used in ship microgrids? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, voltage levels, we have like 690 volts or uh, depending on the application. Let me go a little bit uh, with my presentation. I think I will be able to show you uh, some of these ship uh, bore systems. Yeah, this is one example uh, having, I don't know if you can see it or I have to share again. I have to share again probably. Uh, one second. Yeah. Yeah, here uh, I think that, that now you can see it, right? One, two, three, one second. Yeah, here. This is uh, one of the ships that we have been collaborating with uh, in Poland. This is the Horizon 2. Um, 
And uh, in that case, it's uh, 400 volt, so it's very low voltage, but you have to imagine that this is only one uh, motor in that case. But I can show you a little bit uh, another example. Uh, this is another ship uh, in Taiwan, and this, uh, this is the first uh, hybrid uh, ferry in Asia, and we have been participating on this project. And uh, as far as I remember, this is 750 volt in DC, right? Another example, yeah, this was the one, the, the ferry I was mentioning, 750 volt on DC. In that case, the AC part was 380. You have to imagine that is a very small ferry. Now, when we go higher and higher, I don't know if I have another example. This is another example of a DC, DC ship. You can see 1000 volt. So I say that if you think about DC ships, you have a lot of them working on 1000 volt. Higher than this, the US Navy has been developed 3.3 kilovolt in DC and the, the biggest one it's 6.6 .6 kilovolt. I believe that they are still a little bit higher in voltage, but I will say that more or less this is the limit. And to give you maybe another, this is another example. This is the Viking Lady. It's a platform support vessel in Norway, and it has 690 volt. And 690 volt, it's, it's a very common voltage because you know, some of these generators are working already with 690 on AC. So it's, it's, uh, it's very good uh, to consider that, um, I will say. Uh, another example, this comes from, uh, from Singapore. You know that there is the Rolls-Royce. I think it's come from, from the Rolls-Royce um, laboratory in which you can see 690 again in AC moving to 1000 volt on DC. So more or less you have the idea, right? If you think about AC 690, it's very good. If you work on DC, I will tell you normally go to 1000 volt or close to 1000 volt. I don't know if I answer your question. Hopefully, yes. Um, let me see because there's a lot of uh, questions and I don't want some people get disappointed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your praise also. What is the most preferable protection system in ship? Uh, microreads, distance scheme, good. Okay. Yes, I didn't talk about this, as you can imagine, uh, for lack of time. We wanted to be more focused on, on biologic but, uh, systems, but I think that is also an exciting thing. You can see, for instance, this uh, offshore super vessel example. And normally, what the kind of protections that you have are these kind of configurations, probably with the ones that you can use with IC61850. And uh, you can connect, for instance, IDs. Uh, in that case, it was it is for from ABB. But but basically what, what you have is kind of using very fast Ethernet. In that case, it's 100 megabit per second to uh, synchronize all those uh, different controllers, right? If you need more uh, details, we can we can discuss it separately, because indeed we we have been work also a lot with that. Um, some other question from Power Electronics Aspects: Are you also working on multi-port converters for integration of hybrid storage systems? Yes, we have been done some work on that, and um, I think it's very exciting, especially on the on the sense that you could also integrate in a very small. Uh, let's say system, different kind of uh, of renewables um, and and battery systems together. So I will say that that here, what is very important is also to choose the right topologies and uh, new uh, technologies like silicon carbine and especially arsenium, gallium arsenide. Uh, or gallium nitrate also, it's it's something that can reduce a lot uh, the, the volume and higher efficiency. 
Yes, another question is, uh, what is the difference between distance protection scheme and active impedance estimation in shipboard microgrid? Well, I will say that you can, uh, you can use uh, distance protection schemes, but however, uh, impedance estimation is a little bit more complex because as uh, the, you can imagine that the frequency in the ship is changing all the time. And this is very challenging, especially for harmonics. I have some work that I came here for if some questions, but uh, to that we did also for estimating uh, harmonics in a ship. Right now, I can I can see. I, otherwise, I can try to find uh, some publications that we had, in which yes, here as you can see, we have. You see from 61 to 59.5. So you have uh, frequency variations all the time. So using FFT is complicated to get uh, good estimation of harmonics. And the same happened with the impedances. Also, the, the lines are very short. So it, it makes the system, the things a little bit complicated. Probably a good thing to, to study that. Uh, someone asked for my email address. I will just put it here. Something else? Yes, Adriana, hello. Long time not see you. A really interesting presentation, thank you. Uh, related to regenerative fuel cells, how is their efficiency and their limitations? Yeah, efficiency is not so good. I don't have here numbers. Uh, of course, it's, when you think about fuel cells all the time that you are generating electricity, you have almost 50% of probably of losses. On on the on on the process, so it's very good if you think to combine it with micro how to say micro uh, CHPs. It's excellent. Uh, here we have the experience of adding micro CHP. You can raise efficiencies up to 90, 95 percent. So that's why it's so important to have that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rit, also. Also, amazing to collaborate this with, with our book. Um, yes, some other question. Which is the most preferred DCDC topology in ship microgrid? Well, I just can tell you about my experience in when we work with this other project um, with the first uh, ferry in Asia, in Kaohsiung. I'm going to show share with you because I think it's something very interesting. Um, one second, just. It's exactly this, the ferry, but I want to show you again the electric system for the power electronic lovers. Yeah, here is the electric system. You know, in that project, we had three ACDC converters, so it's like three leg, three phase bridge, a uh, three leg bridge uh, converter. And the funny thing is that the DC DC converter was also a three leg inverter, but all these three legs were coupled by three inductances uh, connected together, making interleaving. So it was like a bi directional back boost converter uh, of three phases interleaved with the same topology. And, and this happened a lot. You can see companies like Danfoss that right now have other companies uh, using the same topology. So I will say that this is because it's very, very uh, easy for them. And it's the same uh, module that you use for ACDC, ACDC conversion that you could have DC-DC conversion and also you increase the, the switching frequency, effective switch, switching frequency by three using the same IGBTs. So the, I, I will say that this is one of the possible topologies that I can see in the market. But but I think it's very interesting also to study other topologies. Can you show a slide of that topology we cannot see? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. One second. Uh, yes. Hopefully you can see it in one, two, three now. So these are the three uh, inverters and this is the DC-DC converter. So indeed it's not a DC-DC converter as it is. It's a three 
leg inverter coupled with three inductors to the same point, right? You can imagine uh, the topology. Um, thank you, Diego. Some other comment here. Uh, can we use the microbial fuel cell for human waste management in space? Good idea. We are studying this, um, but I, I can come back to you maybe with some studies. But that's a good uh, point. I think it's very important to, uh, to do that. Indeed, there are some initiatives, you know, for instance, maybe you saw that using urine to create electricity. So probably from the microbial fuel cell, we could also reuse part of the waste management, but I guess that we need some treatment. Yes. Thank you. Some other question here. I'm, I'm very happy to, to see questions and have dialogues with all of you. Is there any other questions or no? Participant, you can un unmute and ask. We have uh, five minutes more. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I hope there are no more questions from the part. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the questions because it was even better to have the dialogue with the questions that the presentation itself. Indeed, I prefer to, to have this interaction with all of you because I, I believe that all the people that are connected here in this uh, kind of talks, they, they believe that, that uh, technology is something else there are human beings behind, be, beside that. There is life, and this is the most important. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So on behalf of I to play PES uh, student branch and ATC chapter, uh, I, I mean, I would, I would like to express my our sincere thanks to uh, our Professor Guerrero, sir, and uh, uh, and his your uh, insightful presentation. So such a such a uh, vibrant area. I think uh, all researchers. Postdocs and MTEC students will already uh, gain some some amount of uh, information uh, about uh, these kind of new newer newer uh, collaborative research works and all. And thanks for once again, sir. And thanks for all the participants to attend this webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you very much. Keep in touch, and I yes, wish sir. all of you have a very nice weekend. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.